I would like to play for you a number that I hope you're familiar with. It is not in your hymn book, but it is called All Your Anxiety, written by a man who is very, very active in the Salvation Army. There have been a lot of people who've gotten saved in the ministry of the, the Salvation Army. And uh, he, was, uh, he was an officer for the Salvation Army, a preacher. And he was meditating on that verse, casting all your care upon him. For he careth for you, First Peter 5, 7. He was meditating on that and came up with the idea of the words of this song. I wish it was in your hymn book so you could follow along, but let me play it for you anyway, and, and uh, maybe you'll remember some of the words as I play. All your anxiety. Go ahead, David. Much louder, please, David. Okay, good, good number of you. Good, good. All right, Pete, it's all yours, buddy. Chorus goes, all your anxieties, all your cares, bring to the mercy seat. It's there. And what a beautiful invitation from our Lord. Let's turn to number 467. We're going to start tonight by singing, since I have been redeemed. Boy, what a change happens in a, in a life of a person that has been redeemed. And as Brother Schrock was preaching last night, there's a desire, right? A desire for God's word. 
And uh, so let's sing about that change. We're going to sing the first stanza, then the second stanza, and then we'll sing the chorus. Then we'll sing the third, then we'll sing the fourth, then we'll sing the chorus again. So we're only going to sing the chorus two times after the second and fourth stanzas. All right, let's go ahead and stand. We'll sing 467. <laughs> sing and hear the special music, Lord, that our hearts would, would be stirred to appreciate uh, your goodness for us, who you are. So we ask that in all these things, that your name would be glorified. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, go ahead and be seated and turn to number 321. 321, him about having nothing between yourself and the Lord, no, no sin, uh, no worldly pleasure. And as verse two talks about habits of life, though harmless they seem, there's many things that may not be bad in and of themselves, but if they keep us from doing what we ought to do, if they keep us from serving the Lord, if they keep us from, from enjoying him or, or loving him, uh, that, that, that's not good. And so let's remind ourselves of that need to have nothing between ourselves and the Savior. Again, we're going to do with this hymn, we're going to sing the first, we're going to sing the second, and we'll sing the chorus, sing the third, the fourth, and the chorus. The chorus only on the second and fourth stanzas. You can remain seated as we sing. <laughs> Oh, my God. 
not the first time I have ever done a duet with a flutist. However, that was by far the best flutist I've ever done a duet with. And he's got a nice tone. And thank you, Rachel. Good to have all of you here on this Wednesday night. How are you? Did you have a good day? Well, good. Anybody get in a car accident? No good. All right. Anybody go shopping? Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. No, no shopping. Anybody have Mexican food for lunch? Yeah, yeah. good. <laughs> well, let me begin tonight by saying, first of all, if you are visiting here this evening, thank you. My name is Brother Mike. I am an evangelist. An evangelist is usually a man with about five messages and 15 suits and a fast car. And I go all over the place with my fast car giving my five messages. And uh, it has been a treat to be here at Calvary Baptist Church of Huntingburg. Uh, I uh, need to tell you this. I probably, I probably don't have to, but I'm going to. Some of you know that all week I've been running around in a Mustang. The Mustang is by far my favorite car. It was the very first car I ever bought. It was a I love Mustangs. But however, I do not own that thing. I, there's, uh, please, uh, I got a really, really good deal from a private owner to rent it for a week to come up here to Indiana. So that's what that's all about. I don't want you to think, man, those evangelists, man, they, they make the money. Some of them do, by the way. Some of them, some of them have Learjets. But uh, all I have is a Mustang for a week. And, uh, and, but anyway, that's what that's all about. But what a, what a treat it has been to be here at Calvary Baptist. Good to see your pastor and his family again. And good to see many of you again. And good to meet some of you for the first time this week. And so thank you for letting me come. On the back table, there are still plenty of CDs. But there's also something new tonight. There's a little pile of my prayer cards. Here are my prayer cards. It is a picture you'll see very quickly of my wife and me. And uh, a lot of I've, I've been accused by two churches, both of which are in Maine, but they're weird anyway. Um, <laughs> the, um, I've been accused by two churches of hiring a woman to pose with me. It is not a hire. That is my wife. <laughs> and uh, But uh, if you would promise to pray for me every now and then, please help yourself to my prayer card. I like to tell churches that my prayer card is a good diet plan because most people put their mission prayer cards on their refrigerator door. If my picture is on your refrigerator door, you'll be less apt to go there. <laughs> and so if that, if that helps you out, you're welcome. And, uh, but anyway, if you would pray for me every now and then, my contact information is on the back. The address, however, is no longer applicable. I mean, we, we moved about two years ago, so we have a different address. We still live in the same area, um, but we, we have a little different address. But the phone number is the same, and the email address is the same, and the website is the same. I've got a Facebook page. I know that I'm friends with some of you. Um, um, I'd love to have some more friends from Huntingburg and from Jasper. If you would make me your friend, I would gladly accept. I have never in my Facebook career ever invited a woman to be my friend. I don't want to be a creeper. However, ladies, if you invite me, I will gladly accept. Okay, I just want to stay above reproach there. I also have a Facebook page that has my itinerary on there. If you want to know where I'm at and want to pray for me more specifically, I would covet that. I would I lust for that. And if you pray for me every now and then, I would greatly appreciate it. And uh, so you can go to my website, mychart.com. My son set that up. And uh, my itinerary is on there where I'll be for the next, I'm booking about two years out. And uh, I, my next meeting will be this weekend in the Washington, D.C. area. Boy, how they need the Lord and uh, in that area. And, uh, and then uh, the week after that, I will be in, uh, I will be in, um, in um, not Macon, Georgia. That's later on in November. I'm going to be in, I know the answer, don't tell me. <laughs> um, uh, I can't. I can't remember where I'm going to be. Um, oh, I know, New Jersey. New Jersey. Yes, there are Christians there. Uh, New Jersey, and uh, being doing a week of revival there. Then off to Macon, Georgia, and then off to I'll be up in Maine and I did it the week of Thanksgiving. I'll be in Virginia the week before Thanksgiving. Anyway, all that to say, I'm busy. Please pray for me. There's also on my website a button where you can donate. Please don't tithe. Please don't give what you normally give the church to me, but it is getting harder and harder people to make it as an evangelist. That's why I sell CDs. It kind of helps to supplement my income. 
And so if you'd like to donate every now and then, should the Lord bless you? I have a number of people that monthly donate and uh, have me as, as, as support me. If you'd like to do that, if the Lord should lay me on your heart, I would be very grateful, uh, but you're certainly not obligated to do. But check out the website. There are a few pictures there. And of course, my itinerary is there, okay? But uh, thank you so much for letting me come. Great to be here in Huntingburg. Thank you for the wonderful weather. Not one single raindrop. Wonderful. And I thoroughly enjoyed this week. And uh, thank you for those of you that have helped to feed me. And uh, all of you have been so very friendly. And I really appreciate that. And uh, good to see all of you here tonight on this Wednesday night. How many of you have been here for every single service? Would you raise your hand, please, if that's you here tonight? Lord bless you. Lord bless you. Thank you so much for your faithfulness. If you just raise your hand, I'd like you to do me a favor. On your way home from church tonight, Right over there on Main Street. I don't know what you call it. I'm, 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 I'm going to call it Main Street. You know what I'm talking about. There's a subway. Have you ever seen it? You know, there's a subway there. Subway serves a white chocolate chip macadamia nut cookie that will make your tongue spaz. It is so good. <laughs> I'd like you to go there and just help yourself to one of those cookies. Tell them at the cashier. Tell them at the cash register that Pastor Ballard will be by later to take care of that, okay? <laughs> He'll pay for all of it, and so you just go help yourself to a cookie uh, if, you've had, if you've had perfect attendance. And, uh, so anyway, I probably shouldn't say that. He'll probably take it out of love offering, but uh, <laughs> uh, I know him well. But uh, good to have you here tonight, and uh, I, my, my immediate plan is to stay one more night here in the hotel, and tomorrow morning, probably about 6 in the morning, I'll take off back from Greenville. Looking forward to seeing my girlfriend again who's also my wife and uh, looking forward to seeing her and uh, uh, so I'll get home probably late after early afternoon uh, tomorrow and, and uh, I'll be home for two days and then off to DC and uh, so anyway busy life in Atlanta but good to have you here tonight we are those of you that are visiting tonight we have memorized a verse it's really really impressive you're going to be astounded here in a moment there are going to be people around you that will be standing They'll be doing motions as they give this verse by memory. They're going to do extra especially well tonight because they've got it down so well now. There are also cameras all over the auditorium that are hidden. Well, we're going to post this on Facebook right after the service. And uh, so we get ready to show off, okay? Let's all stand together. I'm not even going to remind you how it goes, all right? This is your final exam. Maybe we should call it a quiz so you don't get quite so nervous, all right? But it's all you. Are you ready? I'll help you. Are you ready? Here we go. On your marks. Get how many of you, by the way, like basketball? I'm in Indiana. Are you are you okay? A lot of, a lot of things. Okay. Did you know that the NBA started last night? They had the first game in the regular season last night. Who cares? But anyway, um, how many of you, because of Larry Bird, are Boston Celtics fans? Anybody? Kind of good for you. Good for you. Yeah. I, I've been to many Boston Celtics games. I used to live up in that area. I've been to many. I think we got to play basketball with the Celtics one time. And it would be terribly, but it was still fun. <laughs> All right, are you ready? On your marks, get set. By the way, are you near a visitor? I, I see Thea back there. And I, what was your name again, sir? Terry. Terry. Have you been here before, Terry? We're so glad you're here. Terry, I need to let you know that you're, you're, there, there are deacons here tonight, I believe, aren't there, Matthew? Okay. It's customary here at this church that deacons will give you a $20 bill for visiting. So <laughs> we'll just see, just see Pete. Thea, just see Pete. And uh, uh, any other visitors besides Thea? And, oh, and you're, okay. Is that your daughter? Your niece. Okay. We're okay. glad you're here. We're glad you're here. 20 bucks right there. 20 bucks. Yeah. 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 Check them out after the service. He's one wealthy dude, so don't, don't kill him. <laughs> All right, are you ready? Stop stalling. Let's go now. Ready? Here we go. On your marks, get set, go. Second Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Second Corinthians 5, 17. Very, very good. Now let's do it one more time, and I'm not going to help you. It is all of you, okay? Are you ready? You can do it. Take a deep breath. Push that dinner down. And take a deep breath and let her rip. You ready? Here we go. On your marks. Are you nervous? Okay, good. On your marks. Get set. Say it. Second Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, 
she is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Second Corinthians 5, 17. Now maybe, just maybe, if you write it, write it, your pastor will lead you in that verse on Sunday. That's totally up to him. Maybe if you bribe him, take him out to dinner with his family. They don't eat a lot. I've eaten with them. They're not, they're not bad. They're not bad. Um, your pastor, food kind of flies a little bit. The other two are very, 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 very petite. And, uh, but, but anyway, maybe if you bribe him, uh, you can do that for a Sunday. Okay? I'm having coffee. You know that, don't you? All right. You may be seated. You may be seated. And let's get into it here tonight. I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to go ahead. And complete tonight what I started last night. If you were not here last night, don't panic. I will get you caught up. We'll get everybody on the same page, shall we? So let's go ahead and start tonight by review. And ladies and gentlemen, I'll be honest with you. I love being able to preach two and three messages in a row on the same verse. And when we review, do you realize that the number one education, if you were to major in education, I know Bethany has a degree in elementary education. She probably learned this in college. I know I have a music education degree, my undergrads in music education. I learned in education that the number one teaching tool, it'll shock you, the number one teaching tool is not the teacher, it is not media, it is not any kind of object lesson. The number one teacher, the number one teaching tool is review. Review, review. Go over and over and over God. And God even said that through Peter when he said in 2 Peter chapter 1, stir them up by putting them in remembrance of these things. God wants us to review. And that's how you memorize a verse. You go over and over and over it for weeks. And slowly it becomes part of you. So review is very, very important, friends. And so I don't hesitate for a moment to review a verse. Review material that we've covered. So let's do that here for the first five minutes or so. Last night, we established a fact that you remember that God, through his word, uses pictures to help us understand theology. And we started looking at a picture together tonight, last night, that is God-given, heaven-sent, Holy Spirit-inspired. I didn't make it up. I'll be honest with you, given my personality, it is kind of a picture that I probably could make up. But what a graphic picture it is, and it's a picture of your lust, my lust for the Bible. And the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2, which if you want to turn there, you'll be all set to go tonight. In 1 Peter 2, 2, the Bible says, as newborn babes desire the milk of the word, as newborn babes. So the picture there is that of a newborn babe. And what is a newborn babe like? They always are born with an appetite for milk. Ladies and gentlemen, you don't need to tell a genuine Christian they ought to love the Bible. You don't need to do that. It's already in them if they've got that new nature, that new man that you just quoted. So we established a fact last night that if I'm saved, I am going to naturally have a desire for the Word of God. Remember also that we established a fact that the word desire is translated elsewhere in your Bible for the word lust. You, Christian, ought to have a healthy, God-given lust for the Bible. If you're a real Christian, there's going to be a lust for the Bible. Now, if you have no desire, no appetite for the Bible, I'll tell you why. You're not a Christian. You need to get saved. You need to get born again. If you don't, you must spend eternity in hell. It is very, very important that we understand that as human beings. But once you get saved, once you ask Jesus Christ into your heart, once you invite him into your life, once you repent and, and invite him in and ask him to forgive you of your sins and you become your savior, at that split millisecond, God gives you a new nature. And one of the aspects, one of the characteristics of that new nature is that you have a genuine appetite for the Bible. The Bible does say that if you're unsaved, in 1 Corinthians 2.14, it says, but the natural, that means unsaved, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. It's very natural. I see it all the time in audiences that I preach at, whether it be camp, a youth group, a church like you, whatever. I see all the time people laughing at preaching. They laugh at the Word of God. You see that all the time. I'll tell you why. They're unsaved. They don't get it. They don't understand what you understand. They're just natural. They're just acting natural. It's very natural for somebody unsaved to find the Bible dumb, stupid, a waste of time. 
But when you got saved, my friend, God changed all that. He changed. He gave you a new motherboard. He changed your hard drive. You've got a different mindset, and you no longer find it silly, stupid, a waste of time. You've got a genuine lust for it. I hope, my friend, I hope I'm describing you. That's one of the ways you know you're a real Christian. You've got an appetite for that book. And that's what Peter's talking about in 1 Peter 2, 2. As newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. However, remember, we establish a fact. That as a Christian, I can dunk up my system. I can quench that appetite. I can turn the volume down, if you will, by allowing sin in my life. Remember, verse 2 is verse 2. Verse 2 is verse 2 for a reason. There's a verse that precedes it. That verse that precedes it is in what we call a prerequisite to, have to verse number 2. Verse number one, my friend, has to happen in your life if you're going to have a genuine craving for the Word of God. And my friends, you want this. You're sitting there right now I'm going, yes, I want that. You're right, preacher. Yeah, bring it on. You want that if indeed you're a Christian. So verse number one was written to Christians. It's a warning verse to all of you. No matter how long you've been saved, no matter what your educational background, no matter what your marital status, God says, watch out, all of you, watch out for verse number one. And in verse number one, we have what I call, and this is Mike Schrock, we have what I call five garments that you are now to take off now that you're a Christian. I say garments because of the word laying aside. Would you look at verse number one with me? Let's look at verse number one. Let's read it. He says, in verse number one, chapter two of first Peter. Wherefore, in other words, because we have a living word, remember at the end of chapter one, he talked about how the Bible is alive. Wherefore, lay aside all malice. Would you look up this way, please? The first garment that we're going to talk about tonight is malice. You'll remember that from last night because we spent a lot of time on it. But before we do, would you understand the word laid aside? Because my friend, it's your job. This is your job. God does not do this for you. He gives you the ability. He gives you the desire. But it's your job. To lay aside malice. Let me tell you what that word laying aside means. I'll have a little fun with you. Years ago, my father in law, who is now with the Lord, ran the Boston Marathon. My wife and I were newlyweds when he did it. And we were living in Boston. He was living way down in Greenville, South Carolina. And I remember in January, we got a phone call and he said, Mike, can your mother in law and I come up there and visit the two of you? I said, Dad, yes. We're kind of lonely. We'd love to see you. Neither one of us has ever lived anywhere near the Northeast. Oh, Dad, Dad, we love you. Please come. We'll figure we were in a little one-bedroom apartment. We'll figure out something. He said, by the way, Michael, while I'm up there, would it be okay with you and your bride if I ran the Boston Marathon? My immediate reaction was, sure, run for a little race. Fine. No big deal. Ladies and gentlemen of Indiana, I had no idea how big the Boston Marathon is to Boston, nor do you. Let me help you. The Boston Marathon is always run on a Monday in April. That's a holiday that you Indianaites don't have. There are only two states in America that have this holiday called Patriots Day. It's always a Monday in April. They always run the Boston Marathon on Patriots Day. That Monday. As that day drew closer, I learned that there was no school, there was no work, it was a holiday. I loved it already. My father in law got there with my mother in law, and sure, on that Monday morning, we got up nice and early, we hopped into our little dots and Nissan, and we drove way out here to Hopkinton, Massachusetts, a suburb of a very large city called Boston. This is where they always start the Boston Marathon. And at 8 in the morning, we got there probably about 7. And folks, when I got there to Hopkinton, I had a hard time finding a parking spot. I thought, hey, this is kind of a big deal. I had a hard time finding a parking spot. I finally found one, and no sooner did I open my door when, blam, I was hit by this festival there. There were pet bands, there were tents, and, and people everywhere, and there were joggers everywhere warming up. They had sweatsuits on, they had gloves on, they had stocking caps on because it was kind of chilly that morning, which you want as a marathoner. 
and they were warming up and they were kind of running around all over the place. And I saw them doing something that was very unusual for New England. They were being friendly. They were saying hi to each other. That's so not New England. And I remember seeing one guy run by the other. Hey, where are you from? Oh, I'm from Kenya. Well, good luck. You'll probably win. Where are you from? Well, I'm from Poland. Oh, good to have you here. Make sure you run the right direction. <laughs> that was a joke. And but they didn't. I, they were, I heard the public address announcer. You people need to wake up. I heard the public address announcer say, uh, 30 minutes until race time. Runners already were starting to congregate behind the start line. It will take people now. When you run the Boston Marathon, it takes a half hour to get everybody across the starting line when the gun goes off. So they were already congregating behind the starting line. I got the bright idea. I just happened to have my camera. I thought, you know what? I'm going to get a picture of this. So I walked about 100 yards down the race course, and I found a good spot on the curb, fought off a couple women, found a really good spot, and I waited, and I waited, and finally I heard the gun go off, and I heard a roar. And they're all so excited to finally get it on the Boston Marathon, the granddaddy of them all. And then see ahead, there were so many people. I kid you not, folks, the ground coming. And here they came. <laughs> and they came right by me. And the guys up front, man, really fast. <laughs> and then a whole sea of heads. And I thought, I'm going to get a picture of my father in law. Where is he? Where is he? I'm looking for him. Never did see him. I'm looking for him. Where is he? And all of a sudden, something happened at that moment that shocked me. I'm standing there on that curve when all of a sudden the air around me is getting filled with clothing. Sweatshirts, fling, gloves, hats, fling, 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 jackets, fling, fling, the sweatpants, fling, 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 landing on the grass back in the common of the hockey bin. And, and there were New England women ready for this. They were running around with shopping bags, picking up all this clothing, and getting up all this free clothing. And I, I remember turning around watching this thinking, you losers, get some clothes. However, I must confess, I got a beautiful red windbreaker that way. It fell right at my feet, size medium, perfect size, waterproof. I wore that puppy for years. Now, people, let me tell you what's going on. Because I lost some of you. Let me tell you what's going on. Because I myself ran a marathon a few years later. Let me tell you what's going on. When you run a marathon, you want to stay warm. You want to stay toasty. And you, you, you warm up with a sweatsuit on and, and gloves and hat and stuff. And you're kind of warming up and getting ready for the race. And, and maybe the race starts at 8 o'clock. So you, you step up to the starting line. The time, the time to get it on. You wait for the gun. And sometimes it takes the race organizers a few minutes to get their act together. And there you are standing. If you're not wearing that sweatsuit, because you don't want to wear that when you're running. If you don't have that stuff on, you, you freeze. So a little trick to the train in case you ever run one someday, Rachel. A little trick of the trade is you purposely wear stuff, extra gear, but you know from your training that should you keep that extra gear on while you're running, you're going to overheat, you're probably not going to finish, you're certainly not going to have a good race time. So you purposely wear stuff that when the race starts, I did this myself when I ran my marathon in Vermont. I had some old gear on, and when that gun went off, I took that sweatshirt off, and I tossed it to my wife, who was standing right over here. You know what I was doing? When the race started, I had to lay aside extra clothing. If I didn't, it's going to hurt me. Ladies and gentlemen, what a beautiful illustration of you. Now that you're a Christian, there is gear that you were born wearing as part of your sin nature. That if you don't take it off, it's going to hurt you. It's going to hurt your race. All of you, if you're saved, you're running from the Lord, aren't you? That's what Paul said. You're running the race. All of you are racers. But when you have this extra stuff on, it's going to hurt your ability to live for the Lord. And the very first garment he is, is mouse. And remember what we said about these five garments? They are what we call the theology sequential. Which means it all begins with malice. And remember what malice meant last night? Malice means to be naughty. In fact, it's translated with that word in the book of James, to be naughty. You know, I say that and I immediately, I immediately get concerned that some of you are going to think I'm talking down to you. My friend, I'm just quoting God. 
even as a 60 year old, I can still be naughty. What does it mean to be naughty? To be naughty just means I deliberately do what I shouldn't do. And I deliberately don't do what I should do. That is naughty. It's always a premeditated choice that you and I made. When I do that, it becomes what the Bible calls malice. It's sin, folks. It's sin. And you need to understand tonight that your sin will always gunk you up. It'll make you sick. It'll rob you of your desire for the Bible. That's why there aren't more people here tonight. They've got malice in their life. They're sick. They're gunked up. Well, I'm not doubting whether or not they're Christian. This verse, I repeat, was written to Christians. It's very possible for a Christian to get very sick and gunked up by their malice. And our churches are full of it. Trust me. Full of it. What do you like tonight? Well, garment number two, which is a sister of malice, garment number two, if you remember from last night, is guile. Guile is your ability to hide your malice. To kind of cover over it and not deal with it and think if nobody can see it, if my pastor doesn't know what I'm into, if my wife doesn't know what I'm looking at at midnight, I'm okay. I'm safe. If my husband doesn't know what I'm watching on TV during the day, I'm okay. I'm safe. No, you're not. You're sick. You're gunked up. And guile is a natural human tendency that we've all got. When we don't deal with our sin, we're not open about it. We don't repent. We don't confess it. We hide it and think we're okay. But no, you're not. You are incredibly sick and gunked up. And because of that, you will always have a problem with garment number three. Would you look at it, please? New material that was all reviewed. New material. Are you ready? What is garment number three? Would somebody please tell me out loud? Hypocrisies. Hypocrisies. Are you aware of the fact that every one of you really good at being a hypocrite. All of you, even your pastor. We're all good. Me especially. I'm really good at being a hypocrite. Ladies and gentlemen, the word hypocrite is not necessarily a bad word. All of you have favorite hypocrites. The word hypocrite in the Greek really means an actor or an actress. All of you have got favorite movies. Let me tell you about one of my favorite. One of my favorite movies of all ever is called, a movie called Chef about an itinerant evangelist down in, in, in North Carolina, West Virginia, Virginia area. And uh, his name was Chef. And in this movie, by the way, I'm on the soundtrack. I play my friend from the soundtrack. And that was great. But anyway, um, there, there's a moment in the movie, people. There's a moment in the movie where there's a wino. He's a, I mean, he comes home every night drunk. I mean, just plastered. And he comes home. I mean, he's staggering through the front door. It's a true story. He's staggering through the front door. And he would always beat his wife. And so his wife reached out for help from Sheffy. I'm going to give the movie away because you want to see it someday. I highly recommend it to all of you, even children. But he comes home. He's, I mean, he's as drunk as he can be. And I won't tell you what happens and how Sheffy deals with him. He eventually gets saved. But, but anyway, the guy playing that wine. Let me tell you about it. He's a good friend of mine. Oh, he makes a wonderful drunk. He's never touched a drop of alcohol in his life. He was a pastor when he made that movie. But he's playing a part that's not really him. Not really him. Dave Walker. Does a phenomenal job in that movie, people. He's a hypocrite. In a good sense, in a good way of that word. But what Peter is talking about in 1 Peter here is a bad hypocrite. Your ability to come to church, your ability to look godly. I mean, all of you here tonight, you look sharp. I mean, you're listening to the preacher. None of you are sleeping. None of you are shooting spit rods at me. I mean, you look good. I will tell my wife here in about an hour, Gloria, we had a good congregation tonight. They paid attention. Nobody was sleeping. If anybody in Indiana is going to heaven, it's them. I mean, you all look good. But you know what? I'm not looking at the real you. You're not looking at the real me. My friend, you are a soul with a body. You're not a body with a soul. We always get that backwards. We are not a body with a soul. 
We are a soul with this shell called the body. And the real you is way down deep inside where none of the rest of us can see. What are you really like? Are you having victory over sin? Have you repented? Are you right with God right now? The rest of us have no idea because you can look the part. I mean, anybody can sing these hymns. The Mormon Tabernacle Choir sings most of these hymns, and there's an unsaved and going to hell like a skunk. They're hypocrites. But I wonder how many of us, as we sing these songs tonight that Brother Pete let us in, I wonder how many of us really meant it from our hearts. I have no idea. You have no idea what, what I'm doing. What, 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 it's way down deep inside. Somebody does sing, however. And who is that? Ah! You're going to get judged, lady. You're going to get judged, sir, by what you have going on on the inside. And where am I a hypocrite? On the inside. I play a part, and we're all good at it. We're all good at looking the part. We're all good at knowing how to talk the talk. We're all good at knowing how to sing the sing. We're all good at knowing how to wear the wear. I mean, we're all really good at it. But is it genuine? Are you for real? If you've got malice and you're hiding it, you're not. You're a hypocrite. And may I remind you tonight that Jesus Christ had his most scathing word. Hypocrites make a man. I hope it makes you mad. And when I'm a hypocrite, folks, I always have a problem with garment number four. Would you look at it, please? There in verse number one, garment number four. He says, Wherefore laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies, 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 envies. Are you aware of the fact? That Calvary Baptist Church is full of envy. It is a big problem. Say, so how do you know that? Because I know human nature. Let me tell you what envy is, folks. Hear me carefully. This is rich. Envy is not jealousy. It's way different. Envy is jealousy with a knife edge. Let me illustrate tonight. Let me have a little fun. What would you think if I walked? into this auditorium late tonight. You had no idea who I was. And I came down here and I sat next to Pastor. He looks friendly. We've known each other for years. And so I sat down next to Pastor. You had no idea who I was. Would you automatically think, oh, Pastor's brother's visiting tonight. Would you automatically think, oh, <laughs> Pastor's brother is no, you wouldn't. What is the first characteristic that marks us as different? Would you go ahead and say it out loud? You'll not offend me. Hello? Yeah, when you're, you're coming. <laughs> I am proud of my ball. I want you people to know that I, people, people try to razz me about being bald, and I just want you to know it is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in my eyes, the psalmist said. <laughs> Those of you guys, and y'all have guys trying to get under my skin. They're trying, at least I got hair. Ooh, so does a Q tip. What are you telling me? <laughs> you know, uh, I like to tell people there's no mess between me and my savior. Um, the, uh, you know, David said, my iniquities is the number of hairs of my head. Which one of us is in better shape? <laughs> Chew on that, meditate on that for a while, okay? But anyway, back to our message. I digress. He's got hair. I don't. Now, let me let me let me demonstrate tonight jealousy. I can look at Brother Rich and I can in my heart, it doesn't even have to be out loud. I can say in my heart, ooh, I wish I had hair. Oh, I really, and by the way, I used to have, I used to have hair, and mine didn't have that white stuff in it, but I, I used to, I used to have hair like that, and mine was a lot softer, but anyway, I used to have hair, and, and I can, I can live in Brother Rick, and I can say, man, I wish I had hair like that, and then to the point where it can become idolatry. That's my houses, ladies, cars, men, rifles, toys, and I can look at that, and, and, and that's jealousy. I'm showing you jealousy. Now let me show you envy. I can look at Brother Rick. And in my heart, I don't have to say to him, in my heart, I can say, Ooh, I wish I had hair like that, and he didn't. You see, envy is jealousy with.
with a knife edge, some kind of ill with it. It's just something that bothers me that God has blessed him with that and done this to me. That's it. And ladies and gentlemen, all of you have a problem with that. Let me tell you how it works. How often are we guilty of something like this? Well, we look at our neighbor. Oh, look at her. She's got a wonderful marriage. She's got a husband that loves her. She does nothing for Jesus Christ. Oh, yeah, she claims to be saved. Here I am, a single mom, trying to give my children to church every day. I'm trying to be faithful. I'm trying to teach them the Bible. I'm trying to live for the Lord. I'm trying to have a great testimony. And I got stuck with a man who left me for another woman or another man. Folks, it happens all the time. You know what's you know what happening? That's empty. That single mom has empty. Look at him. He's got great health. Claims to be a Christian. Does nothing for the Lord. Here I am, a deacon, a Sunday school teacher in my church. I give out track. It's a daily goal to give out at least one track a day. I'm trying to memorize God's word. I have devotions every day. I'm an active member of my church. And yet I got diagnosed with cancer. It's not fair. Have those three words ever left your mouth or have you ever thought of them? That's empty. Amen. It's not fair. That's empty. Look at him. Claims to know the Lord. Has a great job. Here I am faithful to church and I just got laid off. It's not fair. That's empty. People, let me tell you what the opposite of envy is. Ephesians chapter 5 says, giving in all things, giving thanks to the Lord through Jesus Christ our Lord. All things. All things. Can you imagine, Christian? Watch this, would you? Oh, Lord, thank you for my divorce. Are you serious? Yeah, I am. Lord, thank you for my cancer. You can't be serious. Amen. Lord, thank you for my financial hardship. You, know, you can't be real. Really? Yeah, let me tell you why, people. Do you remember the message on Monday night or Sunday night? Trials are good because they grow your faith if you react to them in a Bible way. Do you remember that? What's the Bible way? Lord, thank you. You're in control. I'm learning something from this. I would learn no other way. Oh, people, that takes a big boy. You've got to wear a big boy pants spiritually to do something like that. That's the opposite of envy. But it's human nature. Hey, why are you letting this happen? It's not fair. I'm trying to live for you. Look what you did. You blew it. That's human nature. And when you get to that point, my friend, you have flunked the test. You have failed and you are sick. You are gunked up spiritually. And ladies and gentlemen, when I'm not having victory over those four gods, as one great preacher used to say in yesteryear, there is a flag that flies on the castle of your life that tells everybody who's on the throne. Let me tell you what that flag is. It's garment number five, your tongue. Your tongue. Your mouth, your mouth. Even Jesus himself said, of the abundance of the heart, the mouth flaps away. Your mouth is incredibly potent, people. Incredibly potent. Amen. I want to I I camp here for a second. You need to hear this. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible says back in the Old Testament, be careful, Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, be careful of what you say in the privacy of your own bedroom. Because you can make your own heart sick by what you say, let alone the people that have to listen to you. That's why the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melt seem with grace in your heart to the Lord. Your mouth, my friend, your mouth is incredibly powerful. You can make yourself sick. You can make your family sick. You can make others sick, whoever has to listen to you. But it's also going to be helpful. Your tongue says it all. Ladies, would you look at me? I'm going to pick on you for a moment. I am told by the communication experts that you women in this auditorium will talk two-thirds more 
in your lifetime than the men in this auditorium. You women are good communicators. My wife can talk the pain off the walls. She is an amazing communicator. Why did God do that? I have no idea. Maybe it has to do with child rearing. I have no idea. All I know is you ladies are good communicators. However, I could tell you story after story after story of churches and families that had split up because some woman couldn't keep her mouth shut. Ladies, you are tremendously powerful and influential on the spiritual health of Calvary Baptist Church, your marriage, and your family. I was preaching this message a number of years ago in Rhode Island. During the invitation, it was a Tuesday night, and during the invitation, there was a middle-aged woman that came down that aisle way over there. She got on her knees over here next to the organ of that church. It was an auditorium about the same size as this auditorium. And you could tell she was really, really dealing with something. There were other people that came forward. She didn't come by herself, but she, she stayed there. And she stayed there, and she stayed there. Finally, the pastor got up and dismissed the service, and, and I watched her, because I was kind of fascinated, and I watched her. She finally stood up, and she made a beeline to the pastor and grabbed him by the elbow, and dragged him over to me, and grabbed me by the elbow, and dragged us both back in the corner back there. And she said this, and she gave me permission to share this with you, church. Here's what she said. She said, Pastor, Brother Mike, I work full time at a factory. And every day at 10 o'clock, all the women in our department get around the coffee maker, water cooler, vending machine. And all we do for our 15 minute break is we badmouth. We badmouth our wages. We badmouth each other if they're not there. We badmouth our people. We badmouth, we badmouth. We have nothing good to say. And she said, Pastor, I'm the only one on that floor who's a Christian. I should know better. And God has convicted me. You know what I did in my heart? You know what I did? Yes! Touchdown! Yeah! She got it! Folks, that's exactly what God's telling you. You've got to learn to control your mouth. If you don't, you will never lust for the word of God like God wants you to. Your mouth is incredibly powerful. It can be so wicked, and it can be so healthy. You're the one in control. Lay aside evil speakings. That's what the King James word was. Evil speakings. Did you see that there? At the end of verse number one, it's called evil speakings. Let me tell you about the Greek word. Have you guys here in Indiana ever heard of an onomatopoeia? You ever heard that word before? Anybody here not? Okay, I see some people going like this. Good, I'll help you. Because I didn't know what it was because I went to a public school too. Let me tell you what an onomatopoeia is. An onomatopoeia is a phenomenon that just about every language has. An onomatopoeia is a word. It's what we call a picture word. That when you speak it, when you articulate it, and it comes rolling out of your mouth, it sounds like, the word actually sounds like, phonetically, it sounds like what it's describing. Let me give you an example. When you shoot a basketball here in Indiana, and I know you do that occasionally, when you shoot a basketball and it goes through the rim, but it doesn't touch any of the iron, it goes right through the strings, what kind of sound does it make? Mm. Yes, yeah, swish. That's an automatopoeia. It sounds like. It sounds like when you speak it, but it's describing. What tell me a, tell me the sound that a gun makes? Bang, pow, onomatopoeia. Okay, you with me? The Greek language, and I think most of you know that the New Testament was written in Greek. The Greek language is far more descriptive, far more colorful than English. There's a reason God wanted His word in Greek. The Greek word for evil speakings here is onomatopoeia. It's made up of two roots. Cata, which means to pull down. We get a word catapult or catalog from it to put something down. Pull down, cata, and the word for tongue was lolio. And when a Greek would say it, it sounded like this. And what it's describing is our ability, and all of us have it, even you men, even though you don't talk as much as the ladies, we're all really good at giving our opinion about everything. Well, I think the pastor said, blah, 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 blah. And I think my husband should blah, 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 blah. And I think my wife, my children, blah, 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 blah. I mean, we're all really good at giving our stupid opinions. That's one good word to say. If you can say it as much as you want, that's a good word. Amen. All right. That, you know, like that one. But people, understand. 
The picture here is you controlling your mouth. So you young people, you're so good at destroying the peace and the joy of your family. You ladies, you men, we're all really good at just absolutely wreaking havoc. A lot of it is because we want the attention. But God is telling you, do you understand? God is telling you, lay it aside. Stop it. You're making your heart sick. It's robbing you. You're hurting yourself. Stop it. So friends, we're to lay aside malice, which means to be naughty, guile, which means to hide it, to be sneaky and not deal with it, uh, hypocrites, which is, is to act and not really be genuine, Envy, which means to have ill will, not be thankful, and evil speaking. You've got to control your tongue. When I start getting control of those five garments, then and only then is verse two going to happen. And you want, don't you, Christian? You want verse two. What did it say there in verse two? I've got to hurry here because I'm, I'm, I'm out of time. Give me about five more minutes, people, I'll be done. I'd like to take another half hour, but I won't. Verse number two. As, which means light, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, as newborn babes, would you say that with me, please, out loud? As newborn babes. One more time for grandma. As newborn babes. Doesn't that sound redundant, repetitive? Aren't all newborns babes? Yeah. Aren't all babies relatively newborn? Yeah. What's going on here? I hope, I hope I don't offend anybody with what I'm about to say. If I do, get over it, because it's the truth. But we do not have a good English word for the Greek word used here. The Greek word is brephos, B-R-E-P-H-O-S. That's the Greek word. And let me tell you what the word brephos really means. It's translated as newborn baby. They did their best, people. They did their best. But let me tell you what it really means. The term brephos is describing the delivery room baby. We're talking just fresh, brand new into this world. Just been born baby. Now, how do you translate that? That'd be kind of difficult, wouldn't it? But it's talking about just, just, I mean, just been born baby. Have you ever seen one of those? Then they come into the world and, and, and man, they come into the world and the first thing out of their mouth, what's the first thing out of their mouth, people? A cry. Yeah, I was hoping you'd go wham, but the other cry, cry work. Yeah. And what does that cry mean? What are, they, what are they communicating? That is the only way that God has given that little creature to communicate to Mama, I want milk. I want milk. I don't care who's trying to sleep in this house. I don't care who's trying to read on this airplane. Give me milk. Give me milk and I will not shut up until I have my milk. You get the milk. In fact, people, I think you would agree that one of the warmest sights in nature is when those just been born puppies find the milk. When those just been born kittens find the milk. And people, have you ever noticed that when a puppy or a kid is born, you don't have to reach over to the side and say, here, little kitten, here's where the milk is. They naturally know, don't they? They naturally know what a picture of you. You naturally have a lust for God's word. My wife, as many of you know, is a nurse worked in the delivery area of a large hospital in Chicago for four years. She told me that every healthy baby born in America is born with what is called a routine reflex. Have you ever heard that term before? A routine reflex. What that is, let me tell you what it is. If you're holding a baby that's three months old, around three months old or younger, and it's awake, and it's healthy, and it's alert, and you touch it anywhere on its face, it's naturally going to turn towards that touch with a pucker. Here's the point, people. Why? Because that baby has one thing on its mind. It is single-minded. Bible student, I would encourage you to write that in the column next to verse 2. That's the whole point. A just-been-born baby is single-minded, 
single-minded. God wants you to be single-minded. They say, Mike, what in the world does that mean? Everything that touches you, Christian, there ought to be a pucker, a spiritual pucker. What does the Bible say about that? A new television program, as you see the advertisements and you see what it's about, what does the Bible say about it? A new group, music group, what does the Bible say? A new fashion, girls, what does the Bible say? A new attitude in my mind, what does the Bible say? The way I'm talking to my wife, what does the Bible say? What I'm saying about my past right now behind his back, what does the Bible say? My friends, you, the healthier you are, the greater your rooting reflex. There ought to be everywhere you go, as long as you're away, everywhere you go, there's a pucker. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? We are Bible-minded people. We're single-minded. Now, my wife tells me that one, I believe this is the latest statistic here in the United States, that one out of every 100 babies born in America will come into the world, they look healthy, they look normal, there's no cry, there's no pucker. That is the first indicator I am told to the medical professionals we may have a baby with brain damage. I want you to hear me carefully. Do you have a pucker? <laughs> you have to decide with God's word. If you don't, there's brain damage. You're probably not saved. You understand that? As newborn babies desire the sincere milk of the word. And I love this last phrase. Give me two more minutes. I'll be done. I promise. That ye may grow thereby. Are you aware tonight, retiree? God still wants you growing. Do you never? I'm, I'm looking. I'm looking tonight at a bunch of reptiles. I learned from the crocodile hunter, Steve Irwin, before he got killed by a stingray. I learned that alligators, which are big reptiles, never stop growing until they're dead. And if they live in a pristine environment, they can grow as much as a foot a year. And it's not unusual for an alligator, especially years ago, for an alligator to have a leg with the same lifespan as a man. Back before the flood, it was not unusual to meet a man 900 years old. Can you imagine meeting a reptile, an alligator that was 400 years old, growing a foot a, a year? You would run. We got a special name for them. You know what we call them? Dinosaurs. The word dinosaur, the word dino, if you take it down to its Latin root, the word dinosaur literally means huge lizard. All dinosaurs were people, were reptiles, were animals that never stopped growing. I should be looking tonight at a whole gob of dinosaurs. You've been saved for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, and you've never stopped growing. There ought to be young Christians, new converts, that look at you and say, oh, so that's the way a married couple lives for the Lord. Oh, that's the way a retiree lives for the Lord. Oh, that's the way a teenager lives for the Lord. Every one of you ought to be the, the dinosaur. That's God's will. You've never stopped growing. Well, my friend, let me remind you tonight, there's only one way to grow. And that's by learning and devouring and living the Word of God, the Bible. Every one of you that are saved. I want to have a genuine, I mean, just a craving, a lust. Give me more Bible. I'm always thrilled when I hear about men your age who take correspondence courses from a Bible college by video or by internet, learning the prison epistles, maybe taking Matthew, maybe taking the book of Acts. A couple of years ago, I took, the, I took the course on Revelation, Daniel and Revelation. Oh, that causes growth. Ladies, are you growing? You too could be taking those courses. And I'm not here promoting colleges tonight. That's not my purpose. I just want you to know that all of you ought to have an insatiable appetite for the word of God. Even on Tuesday, you flip on, you flip on your internet, you go to a website or maybe sermonaudio.com and you listen to some good preaching. You're just constantly having an intake of Bible. People, I'm not weird. I'm not weird. I'm a Christian. And that's the way Christians are, if they're not hypocrites. Are you growing? Ask yourself, am I growing? And if not, come on, come on, take a shower, clean up on the inside, lay aside, which you should be laying aside. May God help us. Would you bow your heads, please, and close your eyes? While your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, I want to ask two questions. Would you give your neighbor their privacy?
I know you're sitting next to somebody you trust and like. Would you just give them that privacy here just for a moment? I want to ask you a question. Would you ask me by just slipping up your hand? And folks, I want you to know right up front, I am not going to call anybody out by name. I'm not going to ask anybody to come forward. I will not embarrass you. I'm the only one looking. Your pastor will be looking too. The two of us are the only ones looking. Are you here tonight? And you would be willing to say, Brother Mike, Pastor, I have stagnated. I've stopped growing. I've plateaued. And right now I'm convicted. I need to be growing. And God has touched my heart tonight. And I'm sitting here right now convicted. And Pastor, would you please be praying for me? Mike, would you please be praying for me? I need to start growing again. Here's my hand. Would you just quietly sum it up? God bless you. Yes. God bless you. Yes. God bless you. Yes. God bless you. Thank you. Many hands. Thank you. You can put those down. I will pray for you, and your pastor will constantly be praying for you. I'm sure he will. I know his heart. One more question. I wonder if you're here and you say, Mike, I have never had an appetite for the Bible. And what you've been sharing tonight, I have found silly, weird. I have never had an appetite for the Bible. And should something happen to me on the way home from the service tonight, I do not know for sure I go to heaven. But I'd like to. Would you please pray for me? Please don't embarrass me. Don't call me out my name. Don't ask me to stand up. But would you please pray for me? Here's my hand. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. Yes. Thank you. I'm not sure I'm going to heaven. Please pray for me. Anybody else? Here's my hand, preacher. God bless you. Thank you. Heavenly Father. Lord, I've seen a lot of hands. Thank you for using your word. Thank you for using your messenger. Thank you for using your word. God, thank you for this crowd tonight. Lord, thank you for the spirit of God that gives people understanding as to your word. Lord, you evidently have been working. God, I pray for these who slip up their hand. Lord, my first question is they should be growing. God, would you help them understand they're the ones in control? They're the ones at the spiritual steering wheel. God, help them to lay aside what they should be laying aside. Lord, help them to discipline themselves to get into your word. Lord, it's a lot harder to get into your word than it is to flip on the stupid TV. God, help them, would you, to have discipline and to start growing again and becoming more and more dinosaurish. And then, Lord, I pray for these who slip up their hand on my hands on my second question. Lord, they don't know for sure they're going to heaven. Lord, would you help them understand all they need to do? It is so easy. All they need to do is invite you into their heart, invite you into their life, to ask you to forgive them of their sin and to be their savior. Lord, you told them that you stand at the door and knock, and if any man would open the door, you would gladly come in. Lord, that's what they need to do. Lord, I pray you to help them to do that. Lord, they only need to do it once. You never leave. You never forsake. God, I pray you give them wisdom. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If you raised your hand on my second question, you don't know for sure you're going to heaven, could I invite you to do something? I'm going to say a prayer out loud. I'd like to invite you to just say it in your heart. Talk to the Lord, not to me. But just talk to the Lord right there where you're sitting. The Bible says that God is a spirit. He's not confined to a body like you and me. He hears the prayer of your mind and your heart. And so right there where you're sitting, would you just pray this? You don't have to say anything out loud from your heart to his ears. Just say, dear Jesus. Go ahead, just say that in your heart. Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve hell. Lord, forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart and rescue me from the penalty of my sin. Thank you for dying on a cross for me. In Jesus' name, amen. While your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, I wonder if you just prayed that prayer. If you did, again, I'm not going to ask you to stand. I'm not going to embarrass you. But if you just prayed that prayer, you meant it. Say, Pastor, I just prayed that prayer. Would you just quietly slip up your hand and you'll put it down? Just tell him, God bless you. Yes, God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Heavenly Father, thank you for what you've done tonight. Lord, I pray for these three that just raised their hands saying that they just got saved. Lord, I pray that you would do it. Or perhaps they could go home and just do it again just to make sure it took. 
But God, I do pray to give Pastor Valor wisdom as he's going to help these people. And Lord, I pray that again for these who slip their hands saying, I need to grow. God, help them with their discipline. God, help them to spend time in your word. More of it. The more time we spend in your word, the more we grow. It's that simple. In Jesus' name, I pray this tonight. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, thank you for letting me come. Please pray for me. I got a long drive tomorrow. And uh, if I have said anything tonight that you have questions about, please come talk to me. I will not talk to you individually like I preach. And uh, so I will uh, keep my voice very low. And uh, but uh, God bless you. Thank you, especially those of you that raised your hand. We're praying for you. Okay? You are graciously dismissed. Go to Subway. Get yourself a cookie. <laughs> <laughs> This will be our last chance. If you want to donate towards uh, at least something new offering, this will be your last opportunity.